everyone to Ducre. Uh, I'm Tim O'Connor, I'm the executive director here at Ducre, and um, I met Charles. I don't know what happened. I just mentioned something, I don't know how we got into the subject, but we mentioned something about the Elizabeth Gardner Museum, and the guy freaked out on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he's obsessed. So I was like, I started talking to him more and more, and he started talking about all the connections he has in the art world, and I was like, you know what, let's do a lecture series. So this is the first lecture in what's going to be a series of lectures um, focusing on crimes in the international art world. Uh, there'll be future lectures probably in September because we don't have air conditioning in here and it's way too hot. So probably in September we'll come back with a second one on the Isabel Gardner Museum because of course that's his forte. And Holocaust restitution and um, crime, you know, art in war zones. But before we get started, I just want to ask a question. Does anyone know why the pyramids are in Egypt? Anyone? Why the pyramids are there? Because they wouldn't fit in the British Museum. <laughs> so, so when we think about art crimes, we think about the mafia, right? We think about teenagers breaking into the Museum of Natural History in, Brit in, Brit in England, stealing feathers for fly fishing, right? But we don't think about our own museums in our neighborhoods. Right? Or the Metropolitan, which recently had returned an item that they bought only four years ago that was looted art. So next time you go to a museum, look at something and see where it's from. And just realize that that thing was probably taken due to colonialism, right? Or the idea that they couldn't maintain or take care of these artworks, depending on what country they were coming from, usually Africa. So with that, I want to pass it on to Charles here. Thank you so much. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Well, welcome. Can you hear me back there? Yes. Yes. So first you might ask, why on earth would somebody steal art in the first place? I hope that I can uh, shed some light on that. This piece is an, a conceptual sculpture by Maurizio Catalan, a famous artist from Italy. And this sold for $120,000, two of them sold for $120,000 at Art Miami Basel. And he made $240,000 for him in the gallery, Gallery Perro team. He paid 30 cents for the bananas. <laughs> Just in case you're gonna ask, and I'm sure you are, that comes with a, a certificate of authenticity, so if someone uh, steals your banana, or if a handyman's in your house and he eats it off the wall, or it rots, you just go out and buy a new banana, tape it up, and it's the, the power and the value is in the certificate, not in that particular banana, so they're interchangeable. And actually, two days after that was sold, an artist named David Datuna, a performance artist, got a little hungry, and he ate the banana off the wall. He swore it was a... Uh, uh, performance art and not vandalism. <laughs> but then Gallery of Protein right away to let the collectors know it's the certificate, not the banana. <laughs> what is interesting is that an artist in Florida named Joel Morford did this in 2000, and he actually copyrighted it. Copyright's a big thing now. I don't know if any of you were watching the War Hall with Prince just recently. It's a very big decision on copyright. So. He did this in 2000, he taped a banana to a green panel and an orange, two different pieces, and copyrighted it. He is suing Catalan because he says that this banana infringes on his banana, that it, he stole his, <laughs> his copyright. And in 2022, a United States district judge from Miami allowed the lawsuit to go forward because he said that Catalan's banana infringes on Morford's banana. He found the story credible but keep in mind the money that was involved here. And so big money propelled Morford to sue for what he believes was an infringement on his idea. And this big money fiasco can be a bit of a metaphor for the big money that inspires art crimes and theft. So while some might say the whole concept of that is ripping off the collector with a few laughs, it is often the case that big money moves the art world and money and greed propels thieves and criminals to do art crimes in the art world. There are exceptions to the rules, but there are collectors who pay very high sums of money, as you all know, in the galleries and the auctions and in the art fairs. The art fairs are big. 
In 2022, the three big auction houses, Phillips, Christie's, and Sotheby's, took in 18 billion U.S. in sales. In 2017, the Salvador Mondi, they said was by Leonardo da Vinci. Many experts did not believe that attribution that it was by da Vinci, but one buyer paid $450.3 billion for this. So he believed it to be by da Vinci. This exploded the last record. The winning bidder was Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. And I'd like him to have my artist business card because <laughs> he's a good collector to have. So in 2021, the global art market was valued at $65.1 billion. And that's consistent annually. So I'm just throwing out numbers there to let you know, you know, it's big money that propels these art thefts. The annual illicit market is estimated to be at $6 billion a year. Now, due to the illicit nature of the sales and the market and the, the business, that estimate can't be confirmed, but that's what experts believe. Uh, art crimes and art theft is big business and big money, and that's always what gives incentive and inspiration to the dirty, dishonest, thieving people we share the earth with. If there's money involved, there's gonna be crime. Interpol always posted on their website that art crimes is the third largest criminal enterprise after drugs and gun running. Now a lot of, uh, there's a lot of debate about that. A lot of experts don't necessarily believe that statistic to be true, but there's absolutely no doubt, uh, no denying that art crimes is a major criminal enterprise and it's billions, six billion a year at least. Sometimes they say eight billion. It's extremely detrimental to humanity. It's, it, it's cultural patrimony and art market crimes damage our collective culture and history and our sense of identity. So let me make a small introduction to myself before I move on, I'll do it quick. I attended Ducre in the 1980s. I went on and attended SVA, School of Visual Arts, and got my degree there later on. I'm a US Navy veteran and 30 years of law enforcement experience, I retired a captain. Now that I'm retired, I'm completely pursuing art and creative endeavors. I am now an artist, a cultural property protection resource person, and an art world investigative journalist and reporter. I have a column in La Voce di New York. I first got interested in art theft here at Ducre. Three things happened that stoked my interest. First, a group of zany artists in Australia that called themselves ACT, the Australian cultural terrorists, stole this Picasso, it's a weeping woman, the weeping woman from the National Gallery of Victoria, Australia. They said, we'll, we'll destroy this painting if we don't get funding for the arts. So they wanted the government to get funding for the arts. And long story short, neither the funding or the destruction occurred the police got a, after the cat and mouse game and they realized they weren't gonna get anything, the police got a tip that it was in a locker in the station. But this happened in August and when we started in September in the 80s, I put that on my easel for a long time, it was there. I'm sure Dr. Fink, maybe even Frank, would walk by and say, mm, what's this guy up to, you know, like this crazy kid, what's he thinking about? But then we went on a bus trip that fall they took us to New York to see an illustrator show, and one of the students had a beautiful painting of a strawberry, a bowl of strawberries in it, and they had to tell her and other students that had works in that show in New York that it, their works got stolen. They stole like six or seven works, and it was very sad. She cried. It was really touching. So I realized at that moment, art theft isn't zany, and these people hurt people, and they hurt society. Once it's gone, it's gone. This is Bobby the Art Cop Volpe. He has a mustache like Dali. So the next thing that happened was I read this book, Bobby Darkop Volpe. He was the NYPD's first, he was the United States' first official art theft investigator that was assigned solely to do art crimes. You, it always used to go to major crimes detectives. London and the Italians and a few other countries already had some art crime units, specialized units established. America was behind a little. So first NYPD with Bobby and then Los Angeles got one. Now the FBI has an art crime team, the Customs does it, you know. This is a portrait I did of Bobby. I eventually met Bobby. This is us in Sama Gundy and we became good friends. And uh, he was a great mentor and taught me a lot. He was a good friend and he got me into Sama Gundy Club. He was my sponsor, which I'm very proud of. 
he was an old school New York detective and he didn't he wasn't afraid to go into the gray to solve his art crimes and sometimes he'd go up to he'd say to the gallery owners I'll get it back but he, he said we're gonna have to do this this way and he'd go to them and say give them back and I won't bust you but I know who you are and he wanted the art he wanted the art back more than he wanted the arrest because to him the art came first but he was an outstanding artist as well so this is another painting I did of Michel Van Rien. He was a famous smuggler. He was from Amsterdam. He was famous for smuggling icons. He made his big name for smuggling icons out of Cyprus, among other ambitious pursuits. He uh, also later on assisted Scotland Yard in making some stings. I painted this of him after we met. We knew each other for some time, but I painted this after we met in Amsterdam in 2009 for dinner. He once faked an antiquity and he, he submitted it into an auction house. They took it readily, like very willingly, and they should have knocked it off as a, as a knockoff, as a fake. They put it in their catalog, and he liked to play art world games like this. He liked to play games to show to prove a point. So the day before the auction, he, he calls them and he tells them, ha, 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 you just put a fake in your, in your catalog. So they had to pull it from the auction block, even though it was already in the catalog. He liked to uh, cause controversy. He liked to push controversial buttons. One of my pursuits, this is Vernon Rapley. He was the uh, sergeant detective of Scotland Yard's art crimes unit. This is a portrait I did to him of him. So one of my pursuits as an artist is I go around the world meeting with all the underworld, criminals, uh, mob guys who do art crimes, forgers, art thieves, smugglers, you know, you name it. But I also meet with the good guys the art theft investigators, the insurance art loss adjusters, art lawyers, and I convinced him to paint, to let me paint their portraits. He now retired from Scotland Yards and he's the head of the Victoria and Albert Museum. <clears throat> these are some of, that's Ian Lawson, these are some of his detectives. I painted portraits of all of them. That's John Myatt, the forger. I won't go over any further into details about myself. If you wanna look into what I do, go to my website, charlesvincentsaba.com. And there you got links to all my social media, but you also got a link to my column in La Voce de New York. My column is dedicated all to cultural property protection and, and art crimes, art theft. So this is John Myatt. This is a photo of us taken in Chichester, England, a number of years ago. He was a poor artist who ended up being a single father. His wife walked out on him when he had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and he was a little hard up for cash, poor artist. So. He started painting original fakes. He wasn't trying to sell them as illegal. He was not signing them or claiming they were from other people. He, he actually put an ad in the Private Eye, a magazine called Private Eye, original fakes, 20th, 19th and 20th century masters for as cheap as 150 pounds. So you could have a Monet, a Modigliani or something for 150 pounds called John. A very capable con man named John Drew saw the ad and started buying some works. He took one of those works, put it in an auction, and got, I think he got 240,000 pounds. So he goes back to John, who was already vulnerable because he was hard up for cash, and he had a, you know, he was a nice guy, but he had kids, and he needed money. So he said, do you want the 150 pounds, or do you want 20,000, and the cabinet keep coming? And so he got lured in, or more, Really, he got conned into the fakes and forgeries business. John painted many works by Chagall, de Buffet. Here is a Giacometti he did. Here's a, a Monet he did. This is John in his art studio. When Drew started this venture, he ended up being like the art dealer. And John was the artist. When he started this venture, he didn't know anything about art. He didn't know much about art, but he was a really good con man. All he has to do is gain their confidence, and he knew how to do that. So he'd start uh, devouring art books enough that he could talk their language. So he started, once he learned enough to talk the language, he started going around to the institutions and to the clubs and to the museums, got in with them, got in with the right people, didn't hurt that he was donating to the museums and the institutions once you donate money you're in. He became a regular habite of the art world and he started getting into their archives to do his research. So he started faking many documents, provenance and certificates of authenticity and he'd get down into the archives and put them into the archives, catalog resume and archives. 
So if someone did their due diligence on Maya's works, they could find documentation that gave the works credence. This is the most amazing part of this fraud, that not the fake paintings themselves, but the fact that Drew could infiltrate the art world and win over the trust of important figures in the museums, gaining access to their archives, which he corrupted with those provenance and records. And to this day, some of those archives may just be corrupted. They don't know how much damage he did, but they sold over 200 paintings for over 25 million. And Maya only made 275,000, which I was, I'm sure he wasn't too happy about that. But some art dealers eventually started becoming suspicious and, and eventually Scotland Yard started looking closer at the operation. After the whole scheme was exposed, Drew and Maya were arrested. Drew got six years, only did two. England has this thing, if you behave yourself, you get out early. Maya did one year and did four months. Now, I attended an art crimes. I got to meet a lot of good people here. I attended this art crime class at New Scotland Yards in 2004. And the detective who ran this case, who investigated this case, he told me Maya was a great man, he was a great artist, he really liked him. He felt bad for him because he was vulnerable, he got sucked into this world of art crime. So when Maya got out, they had confiscated all of his art studio, his easels, his paints, his brushes, all the equipment, it was implements of a crime. And he, he came out a broken man, you know, now my kids, I'm still a single father, no money, and now I don't even, I don't want to paint ever again. He swore he'd never paint again. This detective went to him and said, I want a commission, I want to pay you to paint a portrait of my family. And he went and he got through the red tape and helped him get his art studio back, get set up. And now he painted that painting and kept going, and now he actually sells original fakes for a lot of money. He actually makes money selling Monet's, here's Picasso, Monet, Matisse. This is the portrait I did of him. I did a few portraits of him. So the founder of Scotland Yards, Dick Ellis, got me into in touch with him and we met in Chichester and I did those portraits. Dick Ellis, this is one little one I did of him and him talking to that smuggler, Michelle Van Ryan I mentioned earlier. He founded Scotland Yard's crime unit in 1969, and I really respect this man. He is an old school art theft investigator. He helped with, he led the whole thing when they went over to uh, Norway to help recover the screen when it was stolen. So he was involved in a lot of things, Goyas that were stolen. So I really hope he writes his memoirs actually because he would be so interesting with his experience and his recoveries. But police believe that Maya faked 200 works and they only recovered about 60. So a lot of people have his works in the collections, in their collections, and eventually they're gonna come up on the market. It brings us back to just how big money influences the purity of the art world. There are a lot of honorable people in the art world. I, I like to believe that most of the ladies and gentlemen are honorable, but crime always follows money. It's like an appraiser will not, as soon as you tell them that Monet isn't a Monet, they want to sue you, you know. So an appraiser may hesitate to appraise a questionable work because as soon as a, a Mark Chagall becomes a Mayad or something other than Chagall, they're ready to sue you. One little note is that the auction houses do have a five-year warranty usually. So if you buy a work like the Salvador Mundi, he bought that in 2017. If he felt, and he's a powerful man with money, he could afford it, but obviously he believes it's Da Vinci. But you usually have five years to go back and negotiate and tell them, We've proven this isn't a real painting. But when talking about fakes, I wanted to start with Maya because here the artist and the con man made a really formidable foe, a formidable team against the legitimate art market. It also demonstrates how easily it is to commit fraud in the art world and just how eager people in the art world are to be deceived by people like this if, there's, if they're making money. But Maya was quick to point out that the big money of the art world is what this, what can distort and what counts when looking at art is what counts is the emotional intellectual impact that the work has on us but huge money does prove a fascinating part. He told me he regretted committing the crime but rather enjoyed fooling the art experts. That's his exact, he's with a sm smile and a twinkle in his eye, I rather enjoyed fooling those experts, you know, with that English accent. Who he believes they believe what they want to believe just because they're making money. So what they're looking at when they're looking at Chicago or Picasso is money. They, they, they're looking at the money and not seeing the art. They're considering what the art is worth and the art gets lost. 
And there are a lot of fakes and forgeries out there. Our world is saturated with them. What would they, they, they estimate that maybe 50% of all artworks in circulation at this point in the United States and, and in Europe are, are fakes. And th there's so many numerous by Modigliani, Gadinsky, Malovich, Dali, many more. Here is a fake, the Kirigo. The Kirigo is complicated because they did a lot of fakes of him. He did a lot of fakes of himself, and oddly enough. So this is by Oscar Dominguez, who was a surrealist. He did a fake. It ended up in a Cleveland Museum. They thought it was the Kirigo. I'm, cu I'm currently working on a small film about the Kirigo fakes. So another market that is huge is, the, is fakes in antiquities, like Greco-Romano, Greek and Roman. Often the, the criminals who deal in, in illicit antiquities also make fakes and sell fakes. So if you're dealing with dirty dealers, you might get burned. And I think you deserve it too if, you, if you're dealing with them because there are four or five dealers that are notorious for selling. Do You mentioned the museums. It's the same dealers who sold to the gay. He sold to the, the Met, sold to all these museums, these pieces. Here is a fake Greek Koros that they paid $10 million for in 1985, the Getty. It's really well done. They don't know who this artist is to this day. So let's move on to Nazi war rooting. Holocaust restitutions. Over 600,000 works of art were taken from the Jews by the Nazis. This was the largest systematic art theft committed in history. They looted many thousands of works and many of the works are still not discovered like this Raffaello. These are playing cards that you can buy these from the uh, Monuments Men Foundation. They're really cool. They put on each card a painting that's missing still from the Holocaust days. These were looted paintings. It's in the spirit of the GIs passing time playing cards. Here's a Caravaggio that's missing. So while the heroic efforts of the people over the, of many people over the years, like Armani and his men, got back many works, thousands are still missing now, 80 years later. One discovery that sheds a light on just how many works are still out there from World War II occurred in Munich in 2012 when German police raided a poor, lonely, reclusive, modest apartment. He had over 1,500 works in that apartment. This is a woman seated in an armchair. It was one of, it was a Matisse. This is my friend, Chris Marianello. He helped them recover that in court. This was one of the hordes, it's called the Gerlach hordes. So this was once Paul Rosenberg's, the dealer, and the Nazis took it from him. Rosenberg, and this is just one example of Rosenberg. This is Paul Rosenberg. He was the art dealer of Matisse, Brock, Picasso. Uh, my, fr my friend Chris Marianello runs a business called Art Recovery Group in London, based in London and Venice. This is him in Venice. So he got two Matisses back for, for Rosenberg's granddaughter fighting in court when they found these. One was from that board, one was from a different situation. But the recluse in question is Cornelius Gerlitz. Some of you might remember this from a few years ago. This was his father, Hildebrand Gerlitz, who was Hitler's, one of Hitler's art dealers. He went around pressuring Jewish people to sell their works under duress and for a lot less than they were worth. And he built up his own collection at the same time. Not everything went to his Fuhrer. And some of the so that 1,500 works was his collection. Some were legitimately his, but many were from Jewish families that were sold under duress. He died in 1960. So now he lived in Dresden, and when they firebombed Dresden, he had moved his art outside of Dresden and hid it. So when they firebombed Dresden, his building got leveled. So the government believed the building got leveled, the art was in it. They never thought he still owned anything. In 1960, he died. He passed on the collection to Cornelius, his, his son. This is Cornelius. So he moved to Munich in a modest apartment. He was a total loner recluse. He didn't work. He never worked his entire life. He, he stayed at home. His only friends were those artworks. He lived like a hoarder. He, his, he had little, he had to walk in his house like this. It was shelves of artworks to home. No place. And he'd bring them out and he'd look at them and put them back and enjoy them. They were his only friends. He got older, much older, and got sick. He didn't, he never worked, so he didn't have health care. They never gave him health care in Germany. So he had to, he would never sell a painting. But since he needed medical attention, he decided to sell one Max Beckman, the Lion Tamer. He sold his painting in Bern, Switzerland. He opens up a bank account in Switzerland so he doesn't have to pay money, taxes in Germany. 
He's coming back on the train into Germany, gets stopped by the German police in a random check. He had 9,000 euro on him, which is legal to travel with, but then when they look deeper, how does he have 9,000? He never worked in his life. He doesn't have health care. He's broke. You know, and he has a Swiss bank account, obviously. They, they got a warrant for his house, and then they were just blown over by the size of that collection, 1,500 works. Many of it was from Jewish families, but they don't even know who they belong to because obviously those families perished. He never got his artwork back. He died while it was in litigation, and he bequeathed that to the Fine Arts Museum in Bern. This is the Salma Gandhi room. There was a lecture there we attended last week on Holocaust. It was very interesting. So this is an area that has to be addressed by lawyers. It's very complicated. And I just want to mention because, you know, every nation is different. If it was, they say it was bought under good faith or, you know, good faith purchase. The one thing I want to touch on is what this lawyer, Raymond Dowd, was actually helpful in pushing and getting passed. One of the big problems in the world, but especially here, was statute of limitations. And if a family saw a piece after decades, it resurfaced, it was hidden in obscurity, and they see it up for auction, oh, that was my grandmother's, you know, I, I have proof it was my grandmother's. They were telling them it was too late, that crime happened 60, 70 years ago. And every state has a different statute of limitations, they vary from state to state. So these Lawyers, Raymond Dowd and uh, Claudia Jaffe, they were instrumental in pushing what uh, President Obama signed in 2016, right at the end of his last term. It's called the Holocaust Expropriated Art Restitution Act of 2016, and it eased the statute of limitations on this stolen art from the Holocaust. So it was really, really helpful in the United States. Now you have six years. Now you can, if you see a, a artwork or a painting go up on auction and you say that's my, that was my grandmother's that was my grandfather's and you have adequate proof you have to have some kind of proof you can bring it to trial and you have six years to do it and and that and that civil claims or causes of action can be done from anything sold between 33 and 45 <clears throat> January 1st 33 to December 31st 1945 anything that was taken or stolen or taken under the rest you know for sales by the Nazis. In 2018, a New York judge ruled, and this was the first successful case of this, and it was Raymond Dowd's, that two drawings by Egon Scheel that the Nazis took from a cabaret owner named Fritz Grunbaum had to go back to the heirs. This one is woman hiding her face, and this one is woman in black pinafore. Fritz Grunbaum had over 400 works taken in World War II, over 400 works were taken from him, and he died in the Dachau concentration camp in 1941. It was really wonderful hearing this firsthand from them. And as we learned from our greatest World War II generation, good always conquers bad, and I really believe that.